Greetings and welcome to Writers on Writing. I'm your host, Dr. Brenda Green, and Writers on Writing comes to you every Sunday and gives you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their lives, and their craft. This radio broadcast is paid for by Megar Evers College. I am so pleased to have with me today a very, very special person. Um, in virtual space. Um, He is a constitutional law expert, and he is also my son, uh, Jamal Green. So welcome, Jamal. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Dr. Green. Oh, you are very welcome. So just a little bit of background information about Jamal. Jamal is a constitutional law expert whose scholarship focuses on the structure of legal and constitutional argument. He teaches constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, the law of the political process, First Amendment, and federal courts. And he is the author of the book, How Rights Went Wrong, Why Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. He's also the author of numerous law review articles. He's written for the Supreme Court. He um, has also served as visiting scholar at the, at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. He's been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, Columbia's vice dean for intellectual life. And he is also a sought after media commentator on the Supreme Court and on constitutional law. So we are so proud of you, Jamal, and just really pleased to have you on this broadcast, Writers on Writing, We're going to be talking about your book, How Rights Went Wrong, and also just hearing your views on some of the issues that we're dealing with today that really impact um, constitutional law. I'm sure that you have some opinions, um, and I know that you will be uh, very strategic in how you share them because I know who you are. So so let's begin. Um, What motivated you to write this book? Well, I I suspect that my path is not that different from the paths of a lot of writers where in some ways you're writing the book without knowing you're writing the book, right? So over many, many years, when I look back at the book, um, when I was basically finished with it, I recognized just about every article I've written somewhere along along the way. So it, it was not a conscious decision to sit down and say, okay, this is what I'm about. Let me write this book. It was more, I think I'd just been been being led there over many years. I was definitely helped by my agent, Andrew Stewart, um, who um, I had a conversation with him early in the process when I didn't think I was writing a book. And he, we just talked about some of the things that I'd written and he, we kind of kicked ideas back and forth and came up with with this with the themes of this book. So, um, and that was about maybe about four years ago, um, five years ago, maybe. Um, and uh, we've been trying to refine it ever since. Okay, so you label this book, How Rights Went Wrong. When you talk about how rights went wrong, what rights are we talking about? What went wrong? So what I'm trying to do is reconcile the fact that we in the United States in particular care very deeply about rights. Uh, And we, 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 we characterize a lot of political arguments in rights terms. I have a right to this or I have a right to that. And we fundamentally disagree about which rights we have, about how far those rights go. And so part of the point is that rights are about disagreement about rights. So I can't come and tell you, okay, here are exactly what the rights are. Uh, And the constitution tells you, you have, you know, X, Y, and Z right. And if you think you have, you know, right W, then you're wrong about that. I I can't tell you that. And that's the point of the book is that we disagree about rights. And so given that we disagree about rights, how can we, as 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 a collective people under one government, a government that's trying to decide what our rights are. Courts do this on a regular basis. And the thesis of the book essentially is that courts shouldn't be in the business of 
declaring that some of us have rights and other, others of us don't, that their main task should be figuring out how to, what I say in the book is mediate between um, rights holders, figure out, well, how can we move forward in ways that recognize the value in each of the claims and each of the commitments that each of the per people as, who are part of a dispute are holding. So I, in some ways I'm pushing back even on the frame of saying, you know, what rights are you talking about? I'm talking about the things that we value, the things that help us to flourish as people. And those are different for each of us because we're all different from one another. You spend a lot of time uh, talking about how to solve this problem. It's very aspirational, very visionary, but you also, um, Talk about how race upended the frame as visions of rights. Can you give us an example of how that happened and what you meant by that? Sure, and, and race is a very big part of the story as anyone who talks about constitutional law in the United States at any length has to get deeply into issues of race because race shapes um, all of American constitutional law. The book starts Powerful at the statement founding. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the book starts at the founding. Um, and that's in some ways defensive because often when I say, no, we take rights more seriously in some ways than we should, um, I, I get, well, the reason Americans do this is because we're, we, have, we have this certain tradition that comes from the 18th century and is enshrined in the constitution or in the bill of rights. And so I wanted to start at the founding historically to show that the way in which the founders thought about rights and they thought about rights a lot and they took rights very seriously, but they thought of rights in collective terms in the sense that they thought that rights were best collect, best protected by communities forming local political institutions like juries, like legislatures, like churches, which they also thought were, in, were, were important sites of politics. Now, the problem with that vision is that it, it was exclusive. Right, so they they were forming a vision for a, a, a community of of property white men, and not it was not only that it was exclusive, but it was abusive. Right, it was oppressive of people who were not part of the community. So a lot in a lot of ways, the rest of American history is trying to figure out, you know, how do we if we you start from this germ, um, how do you actually create rights within a genuinely pluralistic community? And wars are fought over this, and people are people die over this. And by the middle of the 20th century, um, as white Americans in particular and elite, elite white Americans in particular are finally um, understanding the ways in which black Americans and lots of other dis you know, disadvantaged communities have to be integrated into the society. Uh, there, the, the way that that happens is through, through the language of rights. And so the mid 20th century civil rights movement uses the language of rights to say, you can't treat us this way because we have rights. Now, in some ways, that's a problem. And I, the reason I say it's a problem is because the reason you can't treat people that way is not because they have rights, it's because you shouldn't treat people that way, right? It's, it's not about them, it's about you. And you, know, you shouldn't be abusive, you shouldn't be oppressive of people. It doesn't matter what rights they're claiming, it's don't treat people that way, <laughs> treat people as equals. Um, the reason I say it's a problem is because when you take that frame and then move it into other kinds of conflicts, you know, you've got someone walking into a taco restaurant with no mask during a pandemic saying, you can't treat me, I have rights, you can't treat me, you know, you, you, I have a right to not wear a mask. And, and in, in their mind, they're thinking, well, having a right means that you don't get to do this thing, right? I, it's, a, it's a very um, fiercely guarded entitlement. And that I think is actually born out of a context in which we associate rights with oppression, right? The civil rights movement is about oppression, um, but not all rights are about oppression, right? A lot of rights are just, you live in a society, you have disagreements, they're political disagreements ultimately, and you've got to reconcile that with the fact that you live in a society. And I'm, so I'm trying to, to, to pull those ideas apart that when you've got oppression, then it's important for judges to get involved. It's important for, for us to recognize that oppression is, is a serious problem. But to, to divorce that from the land rights, which I, which I think can lead to lots of problems because um, 
you can't, not everyone can't have absolute rights all at the same time. Um, you can't live a society, you can't, you can't construct a society in that way. So you come up with some solutions for how you can um, construct a society where you don't have, look at rights in absolute terms. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then I'm gonna come back and ask you to give us some specific examples around the kinds of rights that have been um, problematic because of the way the courts have looked at rights. So the, the solution that I propose, and I use the, I, I've mentioned this before, that I use the term mediation. Yes. Because I want to reorient the way we think about rights conflicts away from deciding who's right about their rights towards deciding how do we move forward? How do we problem solve? Uh, and so that might involve taking a little bit away from some and giving a little bit to others. It might involve actually making a, a fact-based assessment of how much people are burdened by something, what alternatives are available, really fact-based questions, as opposed to kind of legalistic questions about what the constitution says or what, you know, what which, which I think doesn't get, get us very far in answering real questions about people's, about people's problems. In the law, and I'm gonna get, say, I'm gonna use a technical term, uh, proportionality is the term that I'll use. Uh, in the law, in a lot of other countries, they use that framing. Um, and I, I, sh I don't use that word very much in the book because the book is designed for not a non-legal audience, uh, but for any of you out there who are lawyers, um, especially if you're familiar with other legal systems outside the US, the term proportionality will be familiar. And it's a, it's a structured way of thinking about what's on the other side of rights, um, which is society is on the other side of rights. Um, and how do we think about um, about the interaction between someone who says I have an individual right and a society that has a right to govern um, at the same time. And those have to coexist in some way. And so we need articulated structures for dealing with those kinds of conflicts. Let's think about what kind of burden you're facing. Let's think about, um, is the government behaving rationally? Let's think about what the government's actually trying to accomplish whether that's something we think government should be able to try to accomplish. You've got to give them some leeway because that's what democracy requires. Um, courts are not democratic institutions. Um, and so we have, to, we have to preserve some role for democracy, but also preserve some role for people's individual entitlements. You gave an interesting example of the educational system, for example, in, in India and how they deal with that versus how we've dealt with um, someone not having the rights to education. Can you share, that would be an example of, of, a, of how we can look at this in a different way. Can you just give a brief synopsis of what that's like? Sure, and uh, in a lot of ways, uh, th this is sort of the middle of the book when I sort of get down to brass tacks and really I, I start with some history and then after starting with the history say, okay, here's the, here's the problem. <laughs> and the, the case that you're referring to is a case from San Antonio uh, and I do refer to India because I, I use it as a comparison, but the US case is a case from San Antonio where within the same school district, um, rich and poor neighborhoods got vastly different funding of their schools. That's the traditional US model really since the 1960s and 1970s of funding pu public schools based on local property taxes. This in a lot of ways grows up out of the post segregation response to um, to public school allocation. It's changed from being segregated schools to being geographic allocation. And once it's changed to being geographic allocation, you get white flight uh, and then you resegregate the schools through financing, right? And so there's a challenge to this um, brought um, by a bunch of parents in a poor school district. And they say, look, these are both public schools. They're in the same school district. Why are my books worse than the books across town? Why do I have bats in my school building and they don't. Why do they have air conditioning and I don't? Um, shouldn't public school students in the same district get the same resources? And when I, you know, if, if you ask that question to someone who isn't a lawyer, they say, you know, most people would say, well, yeah, why not? Um, that makes sense that justice seems to require that. But the Supreme Court approaches that in a very legalistic way where they say, well, what category do we put this kind of discrimination into? And through a bunch of machinations, and I won't get into the specific um, 
moves that they make, they end up saying, well, we can't recognize any right to education. We can't recognize any equal right to education because if we did that, we would have to recognize rights to food and rights to shelter and rights to clothing. We can't do any of that. We'd have to equalize the police forces. And this comes from an, uh, an attitude that says, what it means to recognize a right is to recognize it absolutely. We can't recognize it incrementally because we don't have the resources. We don't, we're not used to talking about rights in mediated incremental ways. And so you actually end up losing rights by taking them too strongly because people say, well, if I can't do this, you know, if I can't go all the way, this must not be a right. So if I, if I can't equalize all the schools and equalize everyone's food and equalize everyone's shelter and equalize everyone's healthcare, well, that, there must not be a right to healthcare then, right? And so um, I criticize that in a number of ways, but in part by comparison to, to India, where, where obviously they don't have the resources to to do any of those things either. India has more poor people than any country in the world and more poor children than any country in the world and more illiterate children than any country in the world. And yet their Supreme Court declared a right to education and, the, the, and, and didn't say what this means is we must immediately equalize everything. They said, well, what it means is that if you get a situation where the government is behaving irrationally or is, is just not taking people's rights and interests seriously, there's some leverage that those people have to contest that. So if, and, and the, that, that the Indian Supreme Court ends up um, forcing schools to change their infrastructure so that they're less likely to catch on fire <laughs> during the school day. It ends up forcing um, what's called a midday meal program, which is one of the most successful court and government interventions in the history of the world, <laughs> um, which forced basically, basically the Indian government to provide basic meals to, to students in school, which made them come to school, made their parents send them to school and you use the right to education to do that, right? So it's to say, look, you can get some, you can, you can make some progress without thinking that rights have to be absolute. And also, I know also having some recognition for the role of the government, right? So you don't have, you don't have to order them to equalize all the schools. You can say, well, tell us why this school has air conditioning and this school doesn't. And if the answer isn't I don't know what the answer to that would be other than we don't care about some of these people. And if that's your answer, then you've got to fix it. But that doesn't mean you've got to fix everything. It doesn't mean you've got to equalize everything. So that's, that's the mediation. And one of the most disturbing passages was reading about uh, the, the man who was sentenced to execution and how the courts dealt with that. Um, and that's really, uh, that really says a lot about our criminal justice system and how the courts are dealing with um, issues that they think might might give people too many freedoms or well, explain that. Yeah, that was a very of, disturbing. It's one of the more astounding things you'll ever read. Um, this is a, a case where uh, a man presents statistical evidence. This is a famous set of studies called the Baldus study. Um, statistical evidence showing that um, especially black defendants who have white victims are way more likely to be sentenced to death. Um, be basically because discrimination at the point of, of charging decisions by prosecutors, just juries making decisions about guilt and innocence, judges making decisions about sentencing. Um, and it's just incontrovertible, this evidence. And they bring an equal protection challenge to say this, this is unequal and the court rejects it. And, and part, of, part of what it says in, in rejecting it is, this is Lewis Powell, um, the former Supreme Court justice's opinion where he says, if we recognize the, the role of racial discrimination in this context, we would have to upend the entire criminal justice system. And therefore we can't do it. Um, and it's, it's a really chilling pa passage. Um, uh, so I, everyone should take a look at the book and see what I say about that. One of the things I, I really uh, liked about the book is, is you have to unpack it, but it's very, you're very redundant. You come back to the same issues. I, I like the way that you lay everything out in the beginning and then you flush it out in the chapters and then you come back, you keep coming back. So um, you can almost pick up the book at any place and, and understand the argument because of the way that you are framing it. There's some interesting things that um, you said, I think at one point you said, um, the fr framers vision of rights failed for good reasons and recovering that vision is the problem, not all of it of the 21st century. So there you go, you got Du Bois there, 
you know, quoting Du Bois. So that that's the visionary part that you have. Yeah, well, I start with I, I, I start with Du Bois because I, I race is such a very important part of the book and but also leads us, I think, to where we are, um, which is um, once you make a certain degree of progress on race, you're not there until you start to think you're not you're not going to get where you need to get until you genuinely integrate pluralism into our rights architecture. Um, and we haven't done that. As you said, um, constitutional law can only help when it stops being about the judges. You know, so are we going in that direction? What, what do you see the future here? Or do you see that that can really happen or is that more aspirational? Well, you, you know, you said the book was, I, I don't think you, I don't think you used the word optimistic and maybe that was intentional. It's no, I, I'm no, not, I did not use up. I said aspirational. <laughs> no, I know. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, and you may, you may detect, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm particularly optimistic. Um, you know, the, the book is, the book tries to paint a, uh, you know, tries to, 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 to construct a right forward, a way forward. But there are, there's a lot of dark passages in the book. Um, it's, it's not written by someone who's happy with the way things are. And I don't, you know, I just, just this week saw an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that said that, or it was a fancy lawyer um, saying that um, mask mandates violate the First Amendment because people have decided that it's a political issue whether they wear a mask or not. And, and, and so therefore you can't have a mask mandate. And that, that's exactly the kind of, of, of simplistic legalistic argument that we're, for some reason we're unable to take a step back from. I'm not that confident that current courts are, will reject that argument, even though I could, if we had more time, I could tell you exactly how absurd it is. <laughs> um, I'm not confident how that courts will reject it. Uh, I do, you know, part of the reason you write a book, right, is that you you want to get your ideas out there. Part of the reason you write a book that I try to make more accessible than my lectures might be um, is because you want people who um, are not necessarily lawyers and judges to also read the book and try to think about the ideas in the book. And so I'm trying to spark a conversation that will that will la outlive me. Um, and so even if it even if it takes you know a few decades, I, I just I do want this perspective to be part of the conversation, and that's all we can do, right? Is to is to try to make transparent what you think the problems you see around you are, and, and do what you what what you can within your abilities to to try to move things. I do I do think the reception to the book has been good um, and has been um, productive, and as you may detect, it's it's also not just written for progressives, right? So I, I want conservatives to read this book also and recognize ways in which we can all be part of the mission, which is not something that's happening right now. All right, so just moving um, towards that, I, 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 I agree with you. It's really important that um, that's part of what we do when we write and when we read is, is raising those critical questions. And so now we're really in the midst of something that I keep thinking about reconstruction. Every time I read the news and, and watch the news, this whole voter suppression, and it's moving so rapidly. And I, I said, what, are, what is going on with people? What, what, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, is there any way we can resolve what we see coming? It's like an avalanche is coming around um, this voter suppression across the country. Well, the, the voter suppression um, issues, I think, go 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 well beyond what's happening in this book. And I think right. what you're seeing is, in some ways, the implosion of a political party and the what it grasps at in order to stay relevant. Um, uh, I think there's a recognition that a certain wing of the Republican Party um, will have trouble winning national elections unless a lot of people don't vote. Uh, at least that's that's their bet. And it's been a it's a pretty explicit bet um, on their part, and so what you're this is what you're seeing is is a is a maybe maybe a reorientation of 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 political parties in some ways there are generational changes that are extremely relevant here. I you know I I don't know what the few I'm not I, I'm optimistic myself as I see the ways in which people 
have behaved in, in recent months. Um, but, you know, I do think that the way to defeat this is through politics and is through mobilization. The, the, book, is, the book is bullish on politics. Um, and I don't mean electoral politics necessarily, but I mean, I mean regenerating a political culture, one in which we're actually engaging with one another and speaking to one another. Obviously, if there's if there's a political party that believes that people shouldn't vote, then you can't engage with them. Um, you've just got to beat them. Uh, you've got to just defeat them. It will require um, a little bit of luck and a lot of a lot of political mobilization. But uh, I'm not I'm not yearning for a for you know a one party state. You know I I I want a robust Republican Party that's engaged with ideas and is engaged in conversation and. We just need to move past this period of the party kind of redefining itself. What do you think about their idea, this push for a third party? Do you think that will will um, have any movement? You know, I'm I'm I I, I was skeptical of that until January sixth, <laughs> um, and I'm less skeptical of that now. It's very hard to the U.S. politics are not structured for third parties. Um, so you can't really have three viable parties at the same time because of the way our elections are structured. So you can really only have two. And so what you would need to do is the, the third party would have to vanquish the uh, one of the other parties. You can't just have three hanging around. And that's been our, that's been our whole history. And both parties, you know, Democrats and Republicans have changed their character in lots of ways over the years, in really radical ways over the years. So I'm not sure that there won't at some point be a radical change in the Republican Party. I don't know exactly how that happens because there are structural reasons why it's hard for that to happen. Um, but uh, but I, I don't think that the party can survive as a as this author authoritarian. At least it can't coexist with American democracy um, if it's this authoritarian cult of personality, voter suppression um, party. That that's you know, either the party's got to change itself or, 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 or democracy is done. I mean, that's, that's really that's the, right. the only so, option. So, so what, are, what are your thoughts about expanding the Supreme Court? And do you think that's viable in the next several years? Do you think that's, that's something that could happen? So, so when I say I'm bullish on politics, right, part of that is that I'm not bullish on courts. And I, I do think that courts have an important role to play, but I, I'm very skeptical of of leaning in to the power of the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court is more powerful than it should be. I think that it decides important questions in more momentous ways than it should. It should be more modest, it should be more humble. And so what that means for me is, um, I don't wanna play the game of, well, your side you know, got some justices, I'm gonna put some justices on my side and we're gonna beat you because I don't think that court decisions should be about beating each other. Uh, I think that courts should be less important than they are. Individual judges should be less important than they are. So I actually think there should be more judges on the court, but not in a partisan way, right? So I think the Supreme Court, instead of having nine justices, should have something more like 25 or 30 justices so that each individual justice in their own particular politics is not as not nearly as relevant as it is today, right? So if, exactly. if, you sat, if they sat on panels of five judges and you had 27 members of the court, let's say, um, you know, you don't know who's going to, you're going to, you're going to be, very, first of all, be very cautious about bringing a case to the court because you don't know what judges you're going to get. Um, and picking individual judges will be less, less importantly about their politics. And I hope more important, I would hope more importantly about um, whether they're, whether they're, they're, they're likely to, to do radical things or not. You don't want radicals on a court. That's interesting. Interesting premise. As we come to a close, um, we recently heard about um, the Pulitzer Prize winning MacArthur genius, um, Hannah Jones. I don't know who was refused tenure by the University of North Carolina because conservatives on the board were concerned about her politics around the 1619 project. So that's not really constitutional law, but as an academic, um, you know, how do, what are your thoughts on that? that? That a person who has that stature could go get appointed or supported for tenure by the entire body and then get to the board of trustees of a university and be denied because of her political beliefs or, the, or because they're against, you know, critical race theory. They don't believe we should be teaching yeah. that. 
So I don't. I, I I think they're not saying that that's their reason, and I think part of the reason they're not saying that that's their re they're saying it has to do with the quality of her credentials or something along those lines. Part of the reason they're not saying that is because this is a constitutional issue, <laughs> because North Carolina is a public university, and uh, and they can they could very well be liable for a First Amendment lawsuit for um, for revoke essentially revoking tenure already granted on the solely on the basis of disagreement with someone's politics. That's that's a that might be a serious First Amendment problem, but apart from that, and I I have some views about using the First Amendment in this in that way. But part part of, but I think more important than the than the constitutional issue is that it's just disgraceful behavior by the university. I don't think anyone has an entitlement to be tenured at a at an elite school, but her, the faculty of the University of North Carolina, and the and the and the uh, made a decision. <laughs> Right, and so, so to re reverse that decision, clearly on the politics is disgraceful behavior and they should be called out at every turn, um, engaging in disgraceful behavior. And they're gonna hurt themselves because if you're, you know, if, if you get an offer from North Carolina and you've got a competing offer from somewhere else, you're gonna think twice <laughs> about a university that decides that they don't, they're gonna revoke your tenure based on your politics. That, um, and people who are there, you know, I, if I'm at Columbia University, you know, I think we should start looking at their faculty and seeing who, who we can poach because um, <laughs> that's not a comfortable environment for a faculty member. And it's it's just disgraceful. It is. And so um, hopefully people will um, begin to think differently. And um, I encourage our listening audience to go out and purchase How Rights Went Wrong why our obsession with rights is tearing America apart. Thank you, Jamal, for raising these critical questions. And thank you for this conversation and um, making and writing a book that's accessible to all of us that gets us thinking about what we can do and how we can be more actively engaged in the democratic process. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay. And you have been listening to Writers on Writing with your host, Dr. Brenda Green. This program is paid for by Megger Evers College. Remember, the writer is always reading. The reader is always writing. Keep reading and writing. Empower yourselves as readers and writers. And um, how rights went wrong. Read it. Okay. Thank you so much.